So hi everybody, my name is Victor Stine. I'm working for Red Hat to maintain Python downstream, which means on Fedora and on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. But I also maintain Python upstream, for example, fix the CI to make sure that the CI is always green. And I'm here to talk about the Python performance, past, present, and future. So I would like to start my journey with the very beginning of Python and what has been tried in the past. So Python got many different implementations, and the first one has been created by Guido van Rossum uh, almost uh, 30 years ago. This is called uh, CPython. C is, comes from the language C. So it's written half in Python and half in, uh, in the C language. A few days later, uh, a second implementation has been written in uh, Java. It was first called JPython, but later renamed uh, Jiton. And this one has been created by Jim Huginin. For, for concurrency, a project has been created uh, with the name Stackless Python. Stackless means that you, you are able to switch two different um, core routines, and uh, the Stackless Python make it efficient. This one has been created by Christian Tismer. And the same Jim created also Iron Python, which is written in a C sharp on the Microsoft runtime. And more recently, we saw MicroPython, which is designed for microcontroller. And this one has been created by Dam Damien George. To, to make Python faster, we have a long list of different optimization projects. The first one uh, was the JIT compiler created by Armin Rigo called the Psycho. This one was only for um, a single function, and it was using a decorator. So when you call the function for the first time, it is uh, JIT compiled, and the next call will be faster. Uh, but Armin saw that uh, this design is not really the most efficient way to optimize Python. So later, a recharge project has been uh, founded by the European Union. And as the, the Python, the PyPyTorch project has been created, which is a JIT compiler for Python. And Google also had an intern creating a Laden Swallow, which promised to make Python f uh, five times faster. Dropbox also tried to make Python faster using an LLVM uh, JIT compiler called uh, Piston. It, I think it had one or two people uh, working on that for for a few years. And um, Microsoft also had his project called Pigeon. And if you notice the dates, you can see that most of this project has a end date. So we will try to figure out why they have the end date. When you create a new Python implementation, you have two main approaches. Uh, the first one is to start from the current C Python. And the other one is to start from the scratch. If you, if you start from C Python, uh, this is uh, the approach chosen by Enladen Swallow, Piston, and Pigeon. Uh, when you do that, the cool thing is that you directly get a support for all existing code because it's, it's already C Python. You support C extensions, everything works, and you can just put your change on top of Python. But when you do that, you inherit all the legacy code of Python and owes all the old design of CPython, which again has been created 30 years ago. And maybe some technical change made 30 years ago made sense 30 years ago. But today, our CPU are more coarse, and some, some, um, some design doesn't fit well to, to scale. For example, in Python, we have something called the global interpreter lock, or the GIL. And the GIL basically limits you to one thread. But we have also some specific uh, C structures, uh, reference counting on a specific garbage collector, which also prevent us to implement some kind of optimization. On the other side, if you start a new implementation from scratch, um, the, the design sh chosen by PyPy, Jiton, and Arrow Python. You don't have to all this uh, legacy code and all this old design. You can do whatever you want. And for example, Jiton and Iron Python don't have uh, any gil, so they are able to scale on multiple CPU uh, from the start. 
thanks to the, to the GVM and the runtime of Microsoft. And uh, another example is that PyPy Py Py doesn't, doesn't use reference counting internally, but they use a tracing garbage collector, which is more efficient. Uh, but when you start from scratch, the main uh, drawback is that uh, for the C extensions, either you don't support them at all, which can be an issue depending on your kind of application, or it is, it is slower than C Python. And for example, uh, for PyPy, they have a module called CPyExt, which creates a C Python Py object on demand. So when you access something which is which comes for six extensions, they have to emulate the C Python uh, structures and uh, API. And this, to, this new object has been uh, should be synchronized with the PyPy objects, which works. Uh, but the implementation is quite complex and maybe not the most efficient way to interface with um, C extension. And uh, another issue of uh, the different implementation of Python is that you are in a, in a competition with CPython. And the CPython has uh, almost 30 active core developers to maintain it, just to, to merge the pull request and to work directly. But obviously, we have way more contributors proposing changes. And another issue uh, for the implementation of Python is that all the new features first land in the CPython code which means that uh, the other implementation have to, to catch up to, to Python to, to get these new features. And uh, so why would a user prefer an outdated or an incomplete implementation? And who will sponsor the developments if you have another implementation? And what, what is very interesting with the previous project that I listed to make Python faster it's that, it's that they, um, they wrote a summary of why they decided to stop the project or why the project is tall. And for the case of Unland and Swallow, uh, there are three main reasons. The first one is that at Google, the, Py the Python language is not really used for performance critical codes. So making, making Python faster is nice, but it's not a priority for Google. And uh, having a different Python interpreter caused some uh, deployment issues. It was too difficult to deploy. Being a replacement, it was not enough. And uh, I think that, for me, the most important reason is that our potential customers eventually found other way of solving the performance problem. Because in Python, when you are able to identify the bottleneck of your of the, of the performance, there are many options uh, available to make it faster. You don't need to, to work on that. Uh, another optimization project was the Piston, which was uh, developed for three years. And uh, again, they wrote a report explaining why they decided to stop. And uh, again, one reason was that at Grubbox, uh, they started to re rewrite the, the performance bottleneck code in other languages, such as Go. But they were also very optimistic about the optimization that would be possible to implement in Dropbox. But they, are, they figure out that uh, if you would like to run any kind of Python application, the backward compatibility and the compatibility with CPython to have a very close uh, behavior is uh, very difficult to get it right and to make it faster. So to summarize, CPython remains the reference implementation, but it shows it's a old age. There are multiple optimization projects which failed, and PyPy is a drop-in replacement. It's uh, four times faster, but it's not widely adopted yet. So I would like to ask why. OK, let's move to the present. Uh, when you, as, again, when you identify the bottleneck of your code, you, you have different options to make it faster. First of all, um, please, please try PyPy, because for many users, it just works. Like you replace Python with PyPy, and you, your application becomes like twice faster, or 10 times faster, or even more. It really depends on your workload, on your kind of um, 
function or what you do in your application. And there are many users who just replace Python with PyPy, and it was super fast. And the, the very nice part of PyPy is that it's, it is really fully compatible with uh, C Python. But there are some issues which explain why uh, it's not widely used. And I think that the first reason is the support for C extension. So as I explained, um, it's a little bit slower than uh, C Python, even if it has been heavily optimized last year. Um, but I would like to talk about that later. It has also two, two issues, which are the memory footprints, which is a side effect of uh, the JIT compiler, because the JIT compilers use memory by itself, and uh, you have multiple versions of the code. So in some workload, it can be an issue. And an another smaller issue is the startup time. Uh, when you have, a, for example, a command line interface, you may want to, to, make, to run it fast. But the JIT compiler make it a little bit uh, slower than C Python. But if you use the case of uh, Mercurial when you run the same command multiple times, one solution can be to have a, um, a server running on the background and a client we just connect to the server. And this is a design chosen by, by Mercurial, and PyPy is efficient in this case. And now I would like to come back to the very the infamous um, global interpreter lock. To try to explain it, um, let's say that you have three threads in your application, and they are all CPU bound. Uh, for example, you compute anything with integers or floating point number. And uh, because of the GIL, even if you have uh, something called threads, technically they are Python threads, and you are the C Python is only able to run it once at the same time. So the efficiency is only one third here because I have free CPU. But you have to understand that uh, the GIL doesn't prevent you to write efficient code because uh, the issue is only for CPU bound code. But for example, if you have a different workload of um, using C functions which don't require the Python, uh, Python GIL, you can release the GIL, and it means that you can run two threads in parallel. For example, when you read a file from the disk, uh, Python release the GIL for you. When you compute a SHA-1 hash, uh, hash it's also, you also release the GIL. Or when you compress data with a bzip2, for example, you also release the GIL. So in practice, there are many cases where you can really use multiple threads, and the efficiency is the optimum. But if, to come back to the CPU bound uh, issue, uh, there are there are solution and uh, one one easy way to sp to use all your CPU is a, a module called multiprocessing. It makes the um, the the architecture way easier to spawn multiple tasks in different in different process, because in each process you have a, a GIL. So thanks to that you are able to distribute the workload on all your CPU, and again, the efficiency is 100%. Uh, so the multiprocessing uh, module work around the, the GIL limitation, and there are two very good news for you for the next release of Python. First, uh, the shared memory is now supported, and this is very important when you exchange um, a lot of data between, between the main process and the worker. Because if you exchange, for example, a very large uh, NumPy array, instead of having to copy the large array between each process, you can just put it in the shared memory, and you'll, all process will get it immediately. And there is also an optimization on the Pickle uh, protocol. Pickle is a serial serialization module used by multiprocessing to distribute uh, data across the, the um, worker. And um, a modification has been merged in a Python 3.8, which avoids uh, the memory copies. So you can, um, you can take your array and write it into a socket, and you don't need to duplicate the, the objects. Because previously, you had a very high uh, memory usage peak just for the serialization. And now it, it's more efficient. 
Another option to, um, to optimize Python is to use uh, Cython. And the nice thing with Cython is that you can take your current Python code and compile it with Cython. It's a compiler, so it's only done once. And after that, you, you distribute the compiled code. It's not a JIT compiler. And if you do that, it's already a little bit faster. But if you, if you add some um, annotation about the type, Cython can generate very efficient code because it knows uh, the internal of Python and it can rely on the type to use the most efficient way to execute your code. And the, um, the nice thing with Cython is that it will handle the CIP for you, so you don't have to worry about, for example, the Python version. You don't have to worry about reference counting, which is uh, tricky to get it right. It's like uh, uh, using a memory allocator. It's better than uh, if Python does it for you. So it's a very nice way to write a C extension. And I suggest you to write to use Cython instead of using directly the C API. If your application is mostly using NumPy, you have other options. Uh, for example, uh, Numba is a, um, a JIT compiler which is specialized in NumPy, and it translates your a subset of Python and NumPy into fast code. Fast code means, for example, that you you are able to take your function and execute it uh, with the GIL released. And thanks to that, you are able to spawn a t to distribute a task into different uh, threads and run, it, run them in parallel. And Numba make it fast, really easy to do. And uh, it's not only about um, threading, it's also about um, single instruction, multiple data uh, vectorization. So it means that you, in a single CPU instruction, you can um, execute multiple tasks, which is very efficient when you have um, code which is very um, using a lot of numbers, especially floating point number. For example, the CPU supports SSE, AVX, or the newer version of AVX. And when you do that, you can make the code up to, for example, eight, eight times faster. And you can also use a GPU acceleration, acceleration using Numba, which means to, to take your, Python, your code, which looks Python, and execute it on your GPU, because the GPU are really, really fast to execute uh, floating point numbers. And it supports NVIDIA CUDA, but also RM, ROCK, ROCK M. And um, one of the issues that we had in, uh, in Python one or two years ago was that we got many um, optimization pro uh, changes proposals but we were not able to decide uh, if uh, this kind of change will make Python faster or slower because we, when we run the benchmark, the benchmark uh, sometimes says slower, but if you run it again, it, it said uh, faster. So it was really hard to take a smart decision. So I spent time to, to work on the benchmark suites to, to make it way more stable, to be able to reproduce the results. And thanks to that, now we have the speed.python.org website. Here you can see the performance of the decimal module uh, on uh, four years. And telco is a, a benchmark to compute a lot of numbers using the decimal module. And the good news is that uh, if it goes below, it means that it's getting faster. And this is very important for us to be able to, to accept or to reject an optimization. To summarize, uh, PyPy doesn't require any code change, so please, again, just try PyPy on your code because it doesn't require you to, to do any kind of change. Uh, the multiprocessing module scales uh, with the number of CPU if you are able to, to distribute workload into a different uh, process. But the, the issue is that you, you have to serialize data which can be a little bit expensive but now we have shared memory and faster picker. You should use Cython and not use the C API directly. And Numba makes um, um, NumPy faster. So let's move to the future. I would like to come back uh, to, 
to a point which, is, which become very important for me. It's the Python C API, because as we saw, the Python C API is causing a lot of trouble with C extension, especially on PyPy. And um, I think we have to fix this issue to make Python usable by uh, everybody. And to, to explain you the issue, you have to know that at the early day of Python, the C API uh, evolved organically, which means that there was no clear design of what should be public, what should be private, what should be exposed or not. And because of that, we exposed many internal functions by mistake, because the design was basically that uh, Python is made of many C files, and just to use a function uh, defined in one file and call it in a different file, you, you have to expose it somehow. And uh, for uh, convenience, um, it was convenient to just expose everything. And uh, at the beginning, it was first uh, used inside Python. But some people saw that it would be interesting to use it outside Python. So some people started to write C extension using that. And this is also part of the success of Python because um, because you are able to use all existing C codes, it's really easy to put Python on top of that, and it makes Python very successful. For example, in the scientific world with uh, NumPy. Uh, but because of the, the initial design of the C API, uh, we, we expose way too many implementation details. But before going into the detail, uh, the first good news is that the situation uh, went better in Python 3.8, which is the next release of Python. So to explain you, previously we had all the files in the same directory, which means that um, if you would like to hide a function from the public uh, C API, you have to opt out for that using an if def block to say that, oh, this part is private, don't use it. And we also have a, something called the stable ABI or stable API. But to declare functions which are not part of this API, again, you have to opt out using an if def. And because of the if def design, sometimes we added functions by mistake uh, to the stable API, or we added private function by mistake. So the solution for that uh, was a work started by Eric Snow, is to create a subdirectories. And I continue this work in Python 3.8 to have uh, CPython uh, for the API specific to, to CPython. And the internal is the API that you should not, should not use. But we decided to expose it anyway because for very specific use case, like debuggers or profilers, you may want to access CPython internals. And to, to access the internals, sometimes you cannot execute codes um, you cannot call function when you inspect the internal of Python. So you, we have to expose all the structures. And now the include directory is only what I call the stable C API. Stable means that you, you should be able to use the same API in multiple Python versions. And during this uh, work, we succeeded to move many private functions from the public headers to the internal header. And we also started to move some structure like the Py interpreter states to the internal API. So slowly we can hide more and more implementation detail. And another good news, um, it's something related to the API. When you take your C extension and you compile it, you get a binary file. And when you go to the binary level, there is something called the ABI, which is an application binary interface. And the promise of Python is that if you use um, the stable API, you are able to use the same binary on multiple Python versions. Uh, but there was an issue with that, is when you would like to debug an application, uh, it was very painful to use a debug build of Python because the ABI was different. So if you have a Linux distribution and you would like to use a debug build, you are not able to load all C extensions because all the C extensions are compiled in release mode and the ABI was different. So because of that, uh, you, you had to recompile all C extensions. 
If the C extension don't have many dependencies, it's fine. But if the C extension is like a GTK, which has a lot of dependencies and requires special compilation flag, it can be painful to have to recompile it manually. So now the good news is that because the ABI is the same, you can just use a debug build of Python and you don't have to recompile anything. And uh, a debug build uh, is a build which has many more sanity checks. And this is really efficient to detect uh, many bugs in C extensions. To come back to the API issue, to try to explain you why it is um, causing us so much trouble, you have to understand that the C API is not an issue only for PyPy, but the C API first is an issue for C Python itself. Because of the C API, uh, we cannot implement many simple or obvious optimization. And I, I use the example of a specialized list uh, because I can explain two different problems of the C API with this example. To, um, to explain you what is the specialized list, uh, in Python, when you create a list, it's basically uh, in memory, it's an array of pointers. That's, that's, that's it. Technically, it's a pointer to pi object. So it means that if you have a list of integer, for example, you have to first to go to the, to the list. From the list, you follow the pointer and you go to the number. So there is an uh, indirection, but it's also used more memory because you have, you have the array and for each item, you have a second object, which means that the memory footprint is not the most efficient. And in PyPy, they managed to implement a different strategy, is to have specialized lists. So the array of uh, the list is an array of integer. So you don't have this second object, you don't have this indirection. Everything is directly in the list. And this is a very smart strategy. It's very memory efficient. If you have a, um, a list of, of integer, it's really convenient to do operation directly on integer. You can also specialize your code for this kind of list. But can we, can we do that in Python? Can we modify CPython and the PyList uh, object? Uh, it's not really easy. Uh, there are two, two problems uh, which prevent us to, to do that. The first the problem is that uh, there is a PyList get item macro which access directly into the array. So you have your array of pointer and the macro goes directly into the array. And C extensions must not access the structure directly because if you do that, we cannot modify the structure. If, if the array becomes an array of, um, of integer instead of an array of pointer, you get the wrong, time, uh, wrong type and you get a crash. But maybe we can modify the macro to, to say that, oh, if, if it's a specialized list, Maybe in that case, you return an integer, or if it's an object, return an object. Mm -hmm. But again, the, there is an issue with that, uh, because the PyList getItem macro return a borrowed reference. Uh, to explain you what it is, usually when you call a Python function, like uh, for example, PyLong uh, getLong to create an integer, or PyString from string to create a string, you get uh, something called a strong reference to the object. It means that when you are done with this object, you have to call decref to say that I'm done. Python, you can release the memory. But a borrowed reference, it's something different, is, is a pointer to the object, but you must not call pydecref, because if you call pydecref, uh, you, you may get a crash. But what if we modify the py, py list get item macro to create a temp temporary object? So if you, ima if you imagine that we have this list array of uh, integer, and when you access into this array, you create a uh, py object for this integer, maybe we can do that in the macro, but what happens uh, with this object? When should it be destroyed? We don't know. And this is an issue with uh, borrowed references. We, we don't track the lifetime of the objects. And this is a big issue when you implement a uh, language. So 
in PyPy, they managed to, to implement some strategy to, to support that, but it's a little bit tricky to get it right. It's, um, it's maybe not the most efficient way. And um, the solution would be to just avoid borrowed references because it causes a lot of troubles to, to many people. So maybe we can take the C API and make it better. So for example, we can try to hide um, structure fields, which, makes, which means uh, making structures opaque. And for example, this code must fail with a compilation error because on the second line, we access directly into the Py objects. And this is a thing that I, uh, I would like to prevent because if you give the ability to see extensions to inspect the internal of Python, it means that we cannot modify the structures like Py objects or like Py list uh, object if you would like to implement the uh, specialized this strategy. So somehow we have to make sure that uh, you never access any structure Another change would be to remove all functions using borrowed references, or even worse, functions which are stealing references, which, are, which is another beast. And we should try to, re to replace all macros with function calls. Maybe we, we will have some troubles, because we, also, we already tried to modify uh, to make significant changes be between two Python versions. It was Python 2 and Python 3. And it didn't went very well. Uh, so the, the issue with uh, modifying the C API is that people are actually using the C API. And there, there are many, many C extensions on PyPI. And every, in my experience, every time that we make a change in Python, we, we break an unknown number of projects. So if we modify the CIPI, we will likely break many projects. So maybe we can try to, to fix most of these projects, but it will take uh, a lot of time. So we have to do it anyway, but uh, I'm not sure that it's... Um, so the, the best strategy for the short term, because maybe we can even not fix all uh, issues of the C API, and it will just take too long. So maybe the, there is another way to do that. And the good news is that the PyPy developer are already thinking about these issues for two years, and they came up with um, <coughs> an idea of a PyHandle API so that would be a brand new C API, and the cool thing is that it would be correct from day f uh, from day one, which means that you 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 avoid the borrowed references issues, you avoid all mistake of the the current C API, and from the beginning you start with a very clean and well designed API. So in short, the idea is that instead of exposing everything in Python with a, a pointer to an object, you, you use an opaque uh, integer. Um, it's something similar to the Unix file descriptor or to a Windows handle. So to, you, you, we, we would have something like the open to create an handle, but you cannot inspect what is inside the handle. You only have operation on that like read and off or write for a file. You can duplicate the handle, and when you are done with the handle, you just close it. And the nice thing with, the, with this ID is, is that it's something doable. Uh, for example, for CPython, it would be written on top of the current C API. So we can do, do it right now as a third party project. For PyPy, it would be more efficient because uh, it doesn't expose the internal of a Py object. And the, the idea of a handle on the ability to duplicate a handle, this is something which uh, plays very well with a tracing GC, with, which is a garbage collector used by PyPy. And the other very good news is that if you are already using Cyton, you, you would not have to modify your code because we can modify Cyton to generate the directly code using PyHandle. 
And now I would like to talk about something else. We saw the C, C API, uh, but there is something else in the C API, which is the reference counting. So to explain you the issue, um, Larry Hastings created a project called Gilectomy uh, four or three or four years ago. And the, the idea was to remove the gill. So in practice, it means to replace a single uh, lock with a smaller lock, inch lock, one lock for each mutable object. Uh, replacing the, the lock uh, is, is doable, uh, and he, he managed to do that. But the, the goal of the project was to make Python faster, and he got some performance bottleneck on, um, on something called the reference counting, which is a way to tr track the lifetime of objects. So each time that you access an object in Python, you have to increment the reference count to say that you are using this object. And when you are done, you decrement the reference count. On, and it means that each time that you access an object, you have to modify an integer. But if there are many threads which uh, access to the reference counts, you have to make sure that the reference counting is, um, is consistent. So two threads might not notify the integer at the same time. And one strategy is the current one is to put a giant lock, or maybe we can, you can put one lock per object for each reference count. So Larry tried different uh, strategies. For example, use the CPU atomic operation. The idea of this CPU instruction is that you, you put a lock on a CPU cache line to make sure that only one CPU access this cache line at the same time. And this is fine when you access different objects uh, in the address space of a process. But if you access uh, objects which are closed, you may quickly go into a performance bottleneck because you lock the same cache line and all CPUs are stored because they are waiting for the lock. Another strategy tried by Larry was to not write directly into the memory, but create something called a log of incref on decref operation, like a queue of operation. And the nice thing is that if you incref on decref, when you read the log, at the end, it, it means that you don't have to modify the reference counter because the incref on decref is a null operation. But again, uh, the complexity of the solution uh, and the cost of at runtime was not really efficient. So uh, I don't want to elaborate too much into the detail. Uh, you just have to recall that reference counting doesn't scale well with the number of threads. So it's a very good solution when you have a single thread, but if you would like to spawn an application into multiple thread, it's not the best option. So one, one option that we have in Python is to get rid of the reference counting inside Python to replace the current, um, current garbage collector with a tracing garbage collector, because this is, um, this is a well-tested uh, well uh, strategy, for example, PyPy is using that with success, and many, many modern language implementation are also using the tracing GC. And the nice thing is that we, we can use it inside Python, but outside Python, we can continue to use reference counting. This is not um, an issue for the performance, because what's, what is the most important is really the internal of Python. And another project to make Python faster is to create sub-interpreters. This is an idea of uh, Eric Snow, is to, to use multiple interpreter, um, to add support for multiple interpreter in the standard library. Uh, because, in fact, it, we already support uh, something called sub-interpreter, but the, the API is currently is hidden in the C language. You have to access the C API for that. So this pep wants to make it accessible in Python. And the, the main motivation for that would be to have uh, not a single global uh, interpreter lock, but have one lock per interpreter, which would mean to be able to run each interpreter, uh, all interpreter in parallel. But this is a work in progress, um, because we have to refactor a lot of code to make it possible. 
And the internals of CPython sometimes are very tricky to, to be modified. So to explain you the, the idea of subinterpreter, uh, I would like to come back to the, to the issue of the gear. So if you have a workload which is uh, CPU bound, you, you are only able to use one CPU. Because in fact, the design of Python is to put all threads into a single object called interpreter and to handle uh, the consistency of objects. In Python, we, uh, we put a gill on top of that, which is an easy solution, but not very efficient because we cannot use all CPU. So the idea of sub-interpreter is that you continue to get um, your, your multiple threads, but you put each thread in a different interpreter, and each interpreter is able to run in, a, in parallel. And thanks to that, you're, again, we, we can reach the 100% uh, efficiency. I, and my expectation from this design, if you compare sub-interpreter to multiprocessing, is that because it's a, everything is a single, is into the same process, I expect that we can share more memory between the different threads. And um, so yeah, I expect a lower memory footprint because when you have a very large application spawning uh, 10 process or 20 process or even more, slowly you can reach the, the limit of your, your, your hardware or you may have to pay for a more expensive flavor or, or of a virtual machine on a cloud. And so the expectation of, of a more lower memory footprint is that you will have to, to use less memory and so pay less on the cloud, for example. And I also expect that we will get uh, faster locks uh, because again, we are into the same process. So it's easier to, to do things. And I, I hope that we can do some locking without any system call. But one of the main limitations of the sub-interpreter is that you, you cannot uh, exchange uh, objects directly be between two interpreters. Because to be able to, to get full speed of um, a, a single um, process, a single interpreter, you must not share anything between the two interpreters. So each interpreter should be isolated from the other one. Because as soon as you have a common resource, you need some kind of locking for the consistency. But obviously, uh, we can imagine some solution like, for example, shared memory to pass data without, with a very low hover rate. So to summarize the future of Python, in my opinion, um, the current C API has design issue, and it will be tricky to, to fix them. There is the idea of creating a new API uh, called PyHandle. We, we have to move to the um, replace gar uh, reference counting uh, with tracing garbage collector in, in CPython. And there is the idea of a sub-interpreter in, in Python. So to conclude, uh, there are many previous optimization projects which failed. Right now, you have uh, Cyton multiprocessing and Numba, which are working very well to make your code faster. And there are um, very promising projects, which are the PyHandle API, tracing garbage collector, and sub-interpreter. If you would like to know more about all these topics, here, here is my list of links about, uh, to get more information. And uh, I'm not sure if I have still time to, for questions. So thank you. We cannot hear you. <laughs> thank you very much, Victor, for this amazing keynote. Uh, we will have a few minutes for some questions, and I will kindly ask the audience to come uh, to the microphones here and there for your questions. Yeah, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Seeing all those changes, do you see kind of like in the far future merging C Python and PyPyth at some time in, in the future? Because now you have a lot of changes that go in direction like like what PyPy is doing with the with the, uh, uh, the garbage collection and so on. 
Um, I'm not sure that I understood correctly. You are asking if this change benefit most to no, the, if you if you you would see that in the in the far future the promise to merge C Python and PyPy and make it one project eventually. Uh, I think that one easy solution is to remove C Python and just use to PyPy, but to <laughs> <laughs> because PyPy is way more efficient. Uh, but right now, I'm not sure that we can do that because of the few issues that I listed of uh, PyPy, and I think that the, the most common issue is um, is the C extensions which are slower. And depending on your workload, sometimes it can be really the bottleneck of your workloads. So right now we have to keep both, but maybe in the future we can we can at least converge to the same solution because we are discussing between C Python, Cyton, and the PyPy developers, and uh, we we all agree that we have to move to the same solutions, especially for the PyHandle API. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more question over there. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, I have a question for a very similar topic. You uh, were kind of wondering why PyPy wasn't adopted more. And don't you think that's mostly due to the fact that it just isn't the reference implementation, so people will default to CPython? Uh, I'm not sure that I understood correctly your question, sorry. Is the reason that PyPy isn't adopted more not just simply due to the fact that CPython is the reference implementation, so that people have to choose and don't at the moment have any memory, uh, any any uh, performance problems, they will choose CPython by default. So what I understood is the question is if people why people don't pick uh, PyPy instead of CPython. Yes. And what I understood is that. Um, if PyPy would be just way better, people would just move to PyPy. No, I'm not talking idea. about better, but just the fact that CPython is the reference implementation by, by declaration. Uh, as I said, one of the reasons is that new features first uh, land into CPython. So people sometimes want to get the latest version of Python to, to, to get the latest features. But in PyPy, they, they have a smaller team, so they, they cannot uh, implement, uh, implement them as fast as CPython. So, so it's not an easy issue. I think we can maybe continue the discussion in the hallway, because we are out of time. Yeah. Thank you.